Hey, Shen. Hi. Hi, Aaron. How are you? Great. How are you doing? Good. I found a random conference room in the in our building, so hopefully no one will come in in the middle of my talk. It's mm. 8 p.m. here, so it'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> are you in your lab? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. I was in um, Barcelona last week in Amsterdam. Oh wow, that's cool. Were you in, uh, in the meeting? Were there for a meeting? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. What meeting was that? Uh, it was a GRC. Oh wow. Yeah. I'm just trying to get in as much travel as possible before going back to China. Oh yes, that's true. I I'm saw every... next week. Next I'll... week? Yeah, I'll be in Boston all week. Oh, cool! For another meeting or various things. Nice. Yeah. Do, should we test the um, presentation? Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Um. Okay. Oops. Also oh, for this Zoom, I can't share a portion of my screen, right? I don't know if you. Oh, well, you can do anything you want. Let me. Let me. Oh. Let me um. Oh, it's fine. I think with my Zoom uh, room, I could share a portion of my screen, but oh. I think somehow I don't have that option here. So I'm you, just curious. I'm sharing like uh, I'm sharing something now, but I'm going to stop sharing it. Just try to share. Try to share um, your presentation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Did this work? Um, let's see. Yeah, it looks good. Cool. Thank you. That looks like a cover image. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a hair follicle innervated by touch sensory neurons. Cool. Hey, Da. Hi, Aaron. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Good to see you. Yeah, yeah, I can see you. Uh, and sounds very clear. Uh, good. Good. Can you test out your slides? Uh, yeah, yeah, I will share. Can you hear that, the slides? I can, yeah, looks good. I can hear it. I can see it. Everything. Uh, yeah. Something like that. Mm. Okay. Yeah, looks good. Looks great. Okay. Thank you. I, I stop yes. sharing. Yeah, 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 thank you. Yeah. How's Beijing doing? Uh, not bad, not bad. <laughs> I think it's almost back to normal, apart from the routine PCR testing. Uh, three days, every three days we have to give a test. But I, I think I get used to this already. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. How is it in the U US? Oh, yeah, it's pretty much nothing. I mean, no risk. Yeah, people are still getting COVID and stuff, but there's no no restrictions. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I see. Yeah. So, yeah. It's good. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll be back in Shanghai early September. Early September. Yeah, not next month. Yes, I think I, I will go there as well. OK, yeah. If you want to. I, I have like a weekly neuroscience happy hour in Shanghai. You're welcome to join. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to, 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 to join. Please. Thank yeah. You. And then I hope to get to Beijing soon. Yeah, I think now uh, there's no restriction for travel, I, I believe, at least from Shanghai, uh, I, I believe. So I hope it gets better and better. Yeah, my wife just 
went to Beijing and then came back. Okay. This one? This week. Oh, this week. Okay. Yes. Yes. I know there are some cases、uh, being detected in Hainan and other regions recently, but、uh, I think it's going to be fine. If they stop testing, there will be fewer cases. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the university is quite busy actually、uh, during this vacation.、Mm -hmm. <laughs> A lot of events, conferences.、Uh, Have、uh, you seen the, the talks、uh, in the Beijing Brain conferences? Yeah, th those were great speakers to get. Yeah, of course.、Uh, very great speaker, yes. yes. I think it's the second time they hold. These conferences.、And、the first time is in 2020, I think. It'll be good to do it in person. Be more fun. Definitely, definitely.、Yeah. I think it's supposed supposed to be、uh, offline conferences. It has been、uh, organized things early this year. At the very beginning, they talk about the conference hall, the place to hold this. <laughs> Everything. Has been very well planned until, yeah, yeah recently they cancelled and make it online. This summer, I've been traveling literally all around the world <laughs> meetings. <laughs> It's really great to be in person and seeing everyone. And、um, but you, you've been around the world for twice, right? 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 Two rounds. Yeah, yeah. I have one one more round coming, and then I'll go back. One more round starting next week, and then I'll come back to clockwise、uh, and underclockwise. Yeah,、oh, so jealous. Maybe in a couple years you'll be allowed to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So. Hey, Doc, John. Hi, hi, hey, John. Nice to see you. Yeah. Hey, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't met you in person. Yeah.、Uh, I think we met、uh, the last time、Where? in Chongqing.、Uh, oh, okay. Last year. Yeah. Last year. Okay. Okay. Yeah, oh, arrow, arrow there. Arrow yeah. There. Yeah, so I, yeah. I think today might be a little bit more laid back than last week. Right. The talks, I, I think, will be a little bit more relaxed. Last week was so intense. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of、uh, intense、He's、discussion. <laughs> so I, I was just drinking my wine because I was in Barcelona, and then I was,、yeah. I was so excited. <laughs> I, I stayed up the whole night. I went after that. I was so excited. I went. I walked down to the beach. And I just stayed on the、oh, beach、okay. until sunrise. Well, wow. Okay. Yeah.、Uh, you're only three、yeah. a.m. right? So I'm,、yeah. I'm kind of free about you. Gotta, okay. You're gonna lost the sleep anyway. Yeah.、Um, but yeah, that was Shandong. Yeah, Shandong called me afterwards to、so、talk to me for another hour for for the, his new theory. I、yeah. liked it. No, <laughs> it's good. And we we、yeah. like. I think I you know I I think it was unfortunate. I don't. There were some people in the chat who didn't. Yeah, yeah. Really get the point of the discussion, but、yeah. um, I, you know, I I think that's why we have this to talk about these things. Yeah, it's good. Ah,、uh, New York Zoom has a has a very significant role in promoting this this series discussion. Yeah, Black Shaw is coming、uh, in a few weeks. Oh yeah, yeah.、Mm -hmm. It's it's hard to find another hot topic, right? So everybody want to talk about. Um, I don't know. Whether whether has new new uh new uh, ad, uh adult neurogenesis in the primary brain. It's one of the hot topic can think about. Yeah, let's get those guys. Oh yeah, it's a new new paper come out. Yeah, yeah. Let's try to get them. And also, I think there are some new techniques、uh, being applied in the neuroscience, like spatial、uh, transatomic techniques. A lot of things yeah. come yeah. up. Yes. Yeah. So everyone can suggest other people, and we're always looking for people to suggest speakers and keep it going. Yeah. Yeah. So we will continue this neurozoom for. Uh, another couple of years, I believe. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, it's fun, huh? Yeah. <laughs>
I actually oh, like this. Yeah. I, I like this better than like the weekly seminar at Stanford. I enjoy this better. But we we had some time time conflict, right? So no. what's the normal? Um, it's okay. Four p.m. Yeah. right? It's just after five p.m. Five p.m. is fine. Yeah. Five p.m. is fine. The one problem is people in Europe can't. It's a little bit. Oh yeah. But we, right. there's nothing we can do. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's midnight in the Europe at this moment. Uh, two two a.m. Two a.m. Okay. I think I really have to find a chance to go uh, travel to the US or the Europe. Do hopefully, it. Yeah, hopefully early in the big, but, but now it's still very difficult. I have to do the quarantine once I come back. Yeah. Hope, yeah, and also the flat. It's not that um, uh, convenient at this moment. So. My, I booked my flight to come back from Shanghai. It's $9,000 one way economy ticket. Economy ticket. Okay. Nine thousand. Nine thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah. It's a little, little cheaper than you come back the last time, right? Is it? Um. Really oh, it's more expensive. Then, then it was. Oh. It, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I think I have to go second today. Yeah. 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 No yeah. All right. Yeah, we can um, get started. Mm, so sure. start. Great. Okay. Um, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to um, another NeuroZoom week and um, broadcasting from Stan my Stanford lab today. Um, so before we get started, um, here's who's coming up next week. Uh, Yukiko Goto from uh, University of Tokyo and uh, my colleague at Stanford, uh, Suzanne Pfeffer. So please tune in, please keep letting Zilong uh, me, and me know if you want to present your research. Um, anything, uh, any, any of your latest research will be welcome here. Um, okay, so now it's uh, my great pleasure and honor to introduce the first speaker today, Dr. Sean Meltzer. Uh, Sean is a uh, postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Medical School. She did her um, undergraduate degree at Peking University. Uh, she did research in the laboratory of a former uh, NeuroZoom speaker, uh, E. Rao, and then she um, came to California to do her PhD at UCSF, uh, did a PhD in neuroscience. She worked with uh, the JANs, and uh, here um, she had a, an amazing uh, PhD where she studied um, uh, dendrite morphogenesis. She had um, two major papers, one in neuron, one in cell reports. In the neuron paper, she um, explored how uh, dendrites and um, ex extracellular matrix interact for um, for uh, sort of uh, patterning and uh, of dendrites. And she discovered that semaphorin ligand released from uh, the uh, ECM uh, signals to plexin um, receptors in in uh, in dendrites and how that keeps them on uh, one 2D plane. And then she had further uh, dendrite morphogenesis insights in the Cell Reports paper, and she revealed a role using genetic studies of uh, phospholipid homeostasis. She then moved to Harvard Medical School, where she's in the Department of Neurobiology in uh, David Ginty's laboratory. And um, she has two really awesome papers on bioarchive, and they must be working their way through um, the journals, and uh, she was awarded, um, I think it's right now the most 
prestigious postdoc fellowship you can get the HHMI Hannah Gray Fellowship, also the most amount of money of a postdoc fellowship you can get. Uh, she's a superstar. Um, hopefully we can recruit her to Stanford before you guys scoop her up somewhere else. And um, let's hear her uh, latest, Sean. Thank you, Aaron, for the really nice introduction. Um, can everyone see my talk, uh, presentation? Looks good. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'm excited to tell you about my postdoc work on studying the molecular mechanisms of mammalian touch circuit assembly. So Aristotle classified five main senses, touch, vision, hearing, smell, and taste. Among them, touch is the first sense to develop in human infants, and it remains perhaps the most emotionally central throughout our lives. Touch allows us to decode a wide range of tactile stimuli, thereby endowing us with an extraordinary capacity for object recognition, texture discrimination, and fine motor control. Touch is also critical for social interaction and brain development. Um, for example, touch is, is essential for newborns to thrive and for bonding with their parents. Um, for example, uh, Romanian orphans who grow up without like uh, touch, touch from their parents and other stimuli actually have uh, long lasting uh, consequences. And later on, they tend to develop neurological disorders and have troubles with sensory motor skills. Um, so work from the Ginty lab and others have characterized the, the mature circuits for detecting and relaying touch information. Um, basically, uh, light innocuous touch information is detected by a number of LTMR, uh, LTMRs, which means uh, low threshold mechanoreceptors. Uh, these LTMRs are like other uh, dorsal root ganglion neurons. They have their cell bodies reside in the dorsal root ganglia. Uh, and they have uh, peripheral axonal branches that go into the skin where they uh, form different types of mechanosensory end organs to detect different types of mechanical sti stimuli. And the uh, LTMRs then send uh, touch information to the central nervous system, the, the dorsal horn of the spinal cord and also the dorsal column nuclei. So here they form synapses to, to relay touch information. Um, and for example, uh, different LTMRs can uh, send axons to the um, dorsal horn in a, and terminate in a um, distinct but highly overlapping pattern. So here, touch information is further processed and relayed to uh, the central nervous system and the cortex for touch perception. So I hope you can see that although we know a lot about the, uh, the circuit that mediate touch sensation, we actually don't know much about how the circuit is uh, established during development. So we have some idea of, about the general developmental milestones of LTMRs uh, as they're part of the DRG. So we know that uh, during embryonic day E10 or so, they might, they're born and migrate uh, to, the, uh, to the side of the spinal cord where they pro proliferate and further differentiate to form different types of um, LTMRs. Um, and they share a lot of the same developmental milestones as the other L uh, DRG subtypes. Um, however, we know among all of these uh, developmental milestones, we know very little about the later uh, developmental steps. For example, uh, there's a lot of questions that remain to be explored and answered, such as uh, how do they form specific synapses in the spinal cord? What contributes to the formation of these really remarkable and distinct and mechanosensory end organs in the skin? Um, and also what controls their precise and specific peripheral uh, target region innervation? Um, so these are not just um, fundamental questions about touch neurodevelopment. Uh, these are also presumably the steps that we want to reenact in order to treat neurological uh, disorders in which touch sensation processing is uh, affected. And also these would be really helpful um, steps that we want to reenact when we want to treat uh, sensory and spinal cord injuries. So um, with that question in mind, my postdoc work is to focus on how, studying how touch circuits are established during development. So 
um, I, my postdoc work has been focusing on characterizing and understanding the developmental steps of touch sensory neuron innervation in the skin and in the spinal cord. And I identified a key developmental time point to do RNA sequencing and I compare the gene expression between touch sensory neuron subtypes and also other DRG neuron subtypes. So from this comparison, I identified a list of candidate genes that are differentially expressed in the LTMRs. And this list of genes contains cell adhesion and axon guidance proteins. So from studying the candidate genes um, on the list, I have uh, found two, uh, the, um, that two pathways are in, required for establish, establishing touch circuits. So for today's talk, I'll tell you about one of the pathways, which is the protocatenurin gamma pathways. So what are the protocatenurin? Um, so protocatenurins are the largest subfamily of the cadherin superfamily of cell adhesion molecules. The cluster protocatenurin locus uh, has three major clusters. The alpha and gamma subcluster has uh, a lot of um, genes in this cluster, and they can uh, be uh, assembled by alternative splicing with uh, one variable axon that encodes a one uh, the variable extracellular domain intracellular domain, and also a little bit of the intracellular domain. And this is a splice to three constant axons, encoding the constant intracellular domains. So uh, protein structure work has uh, identified that they are strictly homophilic uh, binding molecules. Uh, for example, um, the green isoforms on one side of that membrane only binds to the, and sig uh, binds to the green isoform on the other side of the membrane. But on the same side of the membrane, they combine to other isoforms. And together, they form this kind of homo, uh, uh, lattice sheet-like structure between two membranes to activate the downstream signaling pathway. So past work from many labs, including uh, Tom Maniatis' lab and Josh Sain's lab, have identified many important roles for the protocatenurin proteins in nervous system development. They're broadly expressed in the developing nervous system in a combinatorial fashion. And one of the, mo the most famous role of the protocatenurin gamma, gamma proteins are the cell dendritic self-avoidance. So people found that if you remove all the 22 uh, protocatenurin gamma cluster genes in the retina, these uh, stubborn amicrine cell cells in the retina start to have a lot of dendrites that are overlapping and crossing each other, and they can't, uh, they can't um, spread out evenly anymore. So uh, from my RNA sequencing analysis, I found that uh, the 22 isoforms of the protocatenurin gamma locus are expressed at different levels. So some are expressed higher in the DRG, while some are expressed at low levels in the DRG. And we, we made a similar finding for the uh, variable expression pattern for these isoforms in the developing spinal cord. So we wonder what kind of roles they may play in the somatosensory neuron development. And the lessons we learned here might have um, broad um, uh, implications for their role in other parts of the nervous system. So to address this question, we first obtained the flux allele uh, in which uh, locks P size are flanking the uh, last common shared uh, axons. Therefore, in the presence of Cree, we will inactivate and delete all 22 protocatenurin gamma genes. So we combined this allele with the somatosensory neuron specific Cree, and villain Cree, to specifically delete these green protocatenurin gamma proteins, GFP proteins, specifically in the DRGs, but not in the spinal cord. So to first understand the roles of the protocatenurin gamma proteins uh, in somatosensory neuron development and function, we run a number of behavior assays to look at how these new uh, sensory conditional knockout animals respond to mechanical stimuli. So it turns out that both pups and adult animals are really bad at reacting to the mechanical stimuli such as air puff or indentation uh, on the back hairy skin or on the paw. So this, uh, these exper experiments suggest that these uh, protocatenurin gamma proteins are required for the proper function and maybe development of these uh, somatosensory neurons. So to further uh, look at the sensory loci of this function, 
we first looked into the spinal cord dorsal horn, where all the different kinds of uh, LTMRs come in and they form synapses with the dorsal horn neurons to relay touch information. So uh, in this region, we could also uh, visualize the sensory terminals by expressing uh, synaptophysin TD tomato uh, in the sensory neurons. So here uh, we could visualize the green sensory terminals and we could also co-stain with the excitatory postsynaptic marker Homer one in this locus to look at all the sensory uh, uh, to look at all the excitatory synapses in this region, and then we could overlay these two channels to look at the synapses formed by the sensory axons or sensory terminals. So what we saw was that the number or density of sensory terminals did not change in this region. But these sensory terminals, each, each of them form way fewer and smaller sensory uh, synapses with the spinal cord neurons. So the phenotype is summarized here. Um, so after uh, finding out the central synapse formation deficit, we also looked into the skin, into the periphery, to look at what kind of uh, roles they may play in the peripheral axon development for LTMRs. So we could uh, visualize individual LTMRs uh, in the skin and look at their branching pattern. Some form a lot of branches, some form a few, uh, fewer branches. But in general, what we saw was that these LTMRs in these mutants tend to form fewer branches. Um, and interestingly, when we deleted all the 22 protocytinurin gamma proteins in the peripheral Schwann cells, we also saw the same peripheral branching deficit. So these two experiments suggest that the, um, um, the protocoherence can mediate the uh, adhesion between the sensory axons and the peripheral Schwann cells to promote axonal branching, either by physically stabilizing the uh, nascent axonal branches, or it could directly induce downstream signaling that promotes uh, axonal branching. So I've showed you that uh, protocatinor gamma can do two different compartmentalized roles, roles in the uh, central and peripheral axons. So because uh, for the previous experiments I showed you, we deleted all 22 isoforms in the DRG. So then we asked whether the isoform diversity at this cluster locus is important for these two different developmental processes. To address this question, we collaborated with a number of labs to get different deletion mutants for the protocatinurin gamma genes. Um, so here, red lines indicate that these isoforms are disrupted and the isoforms written down here are intact. So then we looked into the central spinal cord for synapse formation phenotype and also looked into the skin. And I hope you can appreciate from the summary here is that these two phenotypes are dissociable as some mutants only show deficit in one process, but not the other. Um, so we were very lucky and also somewhat surprised to find out that C3 gene isoform is the only important isoform for the central synapse formation. For example, in the C3 only knockout animal, if we only remove C3, we saw the synapse deficit, but not the skin deficit. So I'm gonna show you in the next few slides about the, um, the experiments that uh, further determine the role of C3 in the synapse formation. So the first experiment we did was a genetic rescue experiment. So we could cross a Cree-dependent um, C3 or, or A1 allele in the sensory conditional knockout mice. There, therefore, in these uh, rescue mice, the villain Cree will simultaneously delete all 22 protocatinurin gamma genes here uh, endogenous genes, but also activates the expression of either C3 or A1 allele. And then we looked into spinal cord for um, the synapse formation phenotype. And then we, what we saw was that expressing only C3, but not A1, is able to rescue the synapse formation deficit back to wild type level. Um, we also did another experiment because uh, the C3, uh, as I mentioned before, um, these protocatinurin gamma proteins are strictly homophilic adhesion molecules. So we asked whether C3 is also functioning in the dorsal horn neurons to promote synapse formation. Uh, to uh, address this question, we generated LBX Cree flocks over C3 knockout animals so that in these animals, 
uh, only spinal cord neurons lacking both copies of the C3. Um, so we also look into the uh, spinal cord and look at their synapse formation phenotypes. And we saw that these spinal cord neuron specific deletion of C3 also had the same synapse formation deficit. So we, um, so based on these experiments, we form a model in which C3 mediates the interaction between sensory axons and spinal cord neurons to induce or promote synapse formation. So then we ask whether C3 itself alone is sufficient to induce postsynaptic specialization. To answer this question, we first looked at this localization of proligocaturin gamma C3 uh, in, the, um, in the synapses. So we could uh, look at the localization of a TD tomato tagged C3 protein when we, ex when we express the protein in the sensory neurons or the spinal cord neurons. And we could co-stain with presynaptic terminal v marker VGU1 and again, Homer1 to look at the synaptic localization. And basically we saw that C3 can localize to both the presynaptic terminal and also the postsynaptic size. So based on the synaptic localization of C3, we asked whether C3 is sufficient to induce synapse formation. To address this question, we performed the artificial synapse formation assay in which we express C3 in the non-neuronal HEX293 cells and culture them right next to the dorsal horn spinal cord neurons to see if they could induce, um, C3 could induce uh, postsynaptic density clustering in the contacting dendrites of these neurons. So uh, when we did the experiment, we also included neurexin 1 beta as a positive control in this assay, which is known to induce the clustering of postsynaptic density protein 95 or PSD 95 uh, in the contacting uh, dendrites. So what we saw with that was that um, both neurexin 1 beta and C3 uh, genes are sufficient to induce PSD95 clustering when compared to the negative controls. So here's a brief summary of the model so far. Uh, we saw uh, that these cluster genes have uh, two different roles in the periphery and the central. And in the central, we're able to narrow down the uh, isoforms to just the C3. And based on the uh, protein structure uh, studies for the proteocatering gammas, we propose a model in which the uh, lattice sheet like structure formed by C3 between the sensory terminals and the post and the postsynaptic uh, dorsal horn neurons can directly promote the synapse formation and induce postsynaptic density assembly. So in these sensory conditional knockout mice, uh, we, we found, we think that the mechanosensory synaptic input to the spinal cord is reduced given their deficit in the peripheral and the central synapse formation. So using these sensory conditional knockout mice, we ask what is the significance of the mechanosensory inputs on the spinal cord circuit assembly and the function. So uh, to address this question, we first look at the spinal cord function so we could record from the uh, spinal cord neurons in live, uh, live mice while applying different, uh, a series of step indentations into the glabrous skin of these mice. And in the meantime, we could record the spinal cord neuron responses using a multi-electrode array recording. Uh, and I hope you can see that in the control mice, these neurons re respond to the onset an offset of the indentation, and they often have sustained response uh, while the indentation is applied. So we saw that these sensory conditional knockout mice have decreased responses to both the onset, onset and offset of indentations, suggesting a functional uh, deficit in the uh, response to touch stimuli uh, when the touch stimuli is applied on the skin. So we also wanted to see if the wiring of the somatosensory circuit is affected in these sensory conditional knockout animals. So to do that, um, we looked at the cortical spinal tract. So normally uh, in the dorsal horn, the cortical uh, neurons will send descending cortical spinal pathway that forms syn excitatory synapses in the dorsal horn region. So we could um, uh, label these tracts with a synaptophysin TD tomato virus. And what we saw was that uh, compared to the control, 
these sensory conditional knockout mutants have way fewer synapses. And also each cortical uh, synap synaptic terminal make fewer synapses in the spinal cord. So this experiment suggests that the assembly of the spinal cord dorsal horn circuit is also disrupted when the mechanosensory synaptic input is reduced. Um, so this is a summary of uh, our findings. So we showed that the cluster protocut hearings can um, uh, function in two different developmental processes. Uh, and we are pretty excited about the finding of C3 in synapse formation. Um, and I think because um, the protocut neuron gammas are, are expressed in the developing nervous system broadly in a combinatorial fashion, uh, the, the fact that the combination uh, of expression of C3 and other isoforms at the cluster could be could make it possible for this cluster gene to encode a code for synaptic wiring specificity. And second, we also saw that the mechanosensory inputs are important and critical for the precise assembly of the somatosensory circuits. So with that, I'd like to thank my postdoc advisor, David Ginty, and also my two uh, talented technicians who helped me with my projects for the past years and my funding sources. So thank you and like to take questions. Thanks, John. Awesome talk. And now we're open for questions. Hi, Sean. I have a quick Thanks question a for uh, Yeah, so I'm curious about C3. So how, how did people come up with this uh, uh, specific domain? Since it has such hum humans, so many dom domains, right? So, so why did they make a C3 um, a knockout in the beginning? I, I think the goal of making these various deletions was to test whether there are different isoform specific roles for different isoforms at this locus. So people have generated a lot of these um, mm -hmm. uh, deletions for the, including the C3 knockout. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I have some mm -hmm. quick comments, right? So I, I saw mm -hmm. so it's very amazing to see C3 com contribute to snap deformation, but uh, in order to make a, a, a argument for uh, which the specific domain of protocol hiring would be critical. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me, so it'd be helpful to be such more comprehensive loss function testing for individual domains, but that's okay. But, but that's our, work for now is it's beautiful but I'm oh curious, thank but you it, yeah. it must be something else right so why is such a small a tiny domain is it outside of the same membrane for some weird structure so it has some uh, amazing structure to test yeah it. yeah right? thank you i think uh for the first comment it would definitely be super cool if we can like specifically delete each isoform and see how yeah, that would yeah. affect the like overall assembly of the nervous system in other regions and not just the somatosensory circuit. Uh, and also, yes, so we do not know a lot about the, um, the in specific unique intracellular domain that's encoded by the C3 uh, isoform. So maybe that unique uh, short sequence can have the ability to associate with PSC95 and other postsynaptic density proteins and recruit them to the synapse to induce synapse formation. Uh, and ab about the, regarding the actual cell or domain of C3 and whether they can be associated with other molecules is a completely open question. And it would be really interesting to see whether different isoforms can be as uh, assembled into like different protein complex, for example. Yeah, yeah great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Kim, do you have a question? You put it in the chat, but if you um, want to ask it, you, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, hi, is, uh, thank, you, thank you for the great presentation. Is there mm -hmm. any known uh, molecular mechanism that regulate the specific localization of is, I don't know, is mRNA level or protein level uh, localization? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I didn't have time to mention this, uh, but we did look at looked at the localization of C3 in the periphery and in the central axons. So in the peripheral axons, C3 is everywhere. Um, it's evenly distributed uh, along the, the axon. It looks like just a tomato uh, protein. But in the central axon, they form these puncta. 
So they're not everywhere. They just form these large puncta. Some of them are found in the synapses. So there is definitely some kind of differential trafficking of these proteins in the central and the peripheral um, arbors. And I'm not sure about MRA. I don't think people have even really looked at that carefully. So, uh, and I'll, also, I don't think we know much about the differential trafficking of these proteocatenin gamma proteins into distinct uh, compartments of the cell. But I do think it's an important question because it directly relates to the compartmentalized roles of the protocaterins in the cell. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Um, hi, Shen. Uh, I got hi, uh, very quick. Hi, hi Shen. Uh, I, I got little knowledge about the protocol here, to be honest. Uh, but I, I do wonder how exactly uh, this protocol here work on the uh, synapse formation. So basically the mechanisms, molecular mechanisms. Yes. Uh, so uh, our study is maybe the first to really demonstrate that protocatenins are um, sufficient to promote synapse formation. So the exact mechanism is not clear yet, uh, but there is a um, proteomic a mass spec study. So when they pull down the protocatenin gamma proteins, they did see that this protocatenin gamma complex can associate, uh, can include PSD95, which probably means that uh, this uh, through its unique or con or common intracellular domain, it can associate with some uh, postsynaptic density molecules. So when they form, or my I guess my model is that when they form this kind of lattice sheet like structure between the pre and postsynaptic membranes, um, the postsynaptic uh, on the postsynaptic side they can recruit a lot of PSD95 and other PSD proteins to facilitate the assembly. I see. I, uh, Shen, yeah. It's, it's I nice talk. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if the like a, a signal with a sensory affin with a specific spinal neural target, not even for the homophilic interaction. So the splicing or something, or, or not splice, the uh, control, the isophone expression has to be coordinated in a very mm -hmm. precise manner to get a like precise sensory circuits, you know, how there's a coordination between sensory and spinal cord. Must yeah, that precise control, not like a stochastic, uh, random mm -hmm. stochastic control, then will be very chaotic. And so there must be some kind of precision. Yes, so yeah, the precision thought. is not known yet. Um, and in our study, we haven't uh, looked at the, like, the synapse formation between a specific LTMR subtype and a specific spinal cord neuron subtype. But I think, yeah, that would be a really interesting uh, follow-up study to see like if uh, the combination of C3 and other isoforms could mediate the precise connections between spinal cord neurons and LTMR subtypes. Thank you. All right, thanks so much. Sean, amazing talk. Good luck with the paper. Thank you. Thank you. Zilong, do you want to introduce right. Mami? Sure. Sure. So, okay, uh, next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dami, so, who is the uh, assistant professor in Tsinghua University. So, Da is a uh, graduate from Nankai University, got his uh, bachelor degree and master degree. After uh, Nankai, he, he went to uh, UK, did a PhD in University of Edinburgh. Um, so uh, after where he studied the uh, uh, molecular cellular uh, mechanism and brain development. So after uh, PhD, he went to postdoc with Oscar Marine in King's College, King's, KCL, uh, where he also briefly working uh, visiting the uh, the uh, Dr. Nessing lab, uh, Nessing Tan's lab in Yale, where he learned the uh, the state of art the molecular uh, single cell RNA sequencing techniques. So, so uh, in two years ago, uh, Doc came back to Tsinghua, so he started his own lab, where he combined all kinds of uh, fancy uh, 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 single cell technology to address the, uh, the fate of the interneuron in the uh, cortex. Today, he will talk about the cortical inhibition neuron exhibits uh, cell type specific maturation program early in, uh, in development. So we'll have another talk uh, up down, up, way up in the brain. 
how the things happen in early development. Welcome, Da. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chu. Thank you. Uh, let me firstly share. Uh, I think you can see. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you very much. So good morning uh, or good evening, uh, everybody, depending on where you are. Uh, this is Dami from Tsinghua University, and I'm very happy to uh, share with you my recent work uh, regarding the generation of cortical inhibiting neuron diversity during the brain development. So as you may already know, uh, the cerebral cortex uh, is the largest part of our brain and it contains enormous number of neurons and glial cells. And those cells uh, exhibit a great diversity in terms of their morphology, their uh, gene expression, their connectivity and uh, electrophysiological properties and so on. So the neocortex, uh, as its name indicates, is the newest part of the cerebral cortex uh, during evolution. And it get involved in the higher order uh, brain functions like uh, the memory, the cognition, the sensory perceptions, so to speak. So one of the key features uh, of the neocortex is its six layer cellular organizations on its radial dimension. And the neocortex contains both the uh, excitatory and inhibited neurons. And around uh, one fifth uh, of neurons in the neocortex are inhibitory neurons. And those neurons play a very important role in regulating uh, the activity <clears throat> of the excitatory or the inhibitory neurons they connected with. And at the population level, uh, the inhibited neurons control the synchronization and oscillation of uh, the neural networks in, in the brain. So the cortical inhibited neurons uh, exhibit a great diversity and such diversity uh, can be recognized uh, through a uh, hierarchical way uh, from the major class at the top level and going down to the cell types at the bottom level. So basically uh, there are three uh, major classes of cortical inhibited neurons. And they are PV, uh, somatostatin and the serotonin receptor 3A expressing populations, as you can see here. And each of them can be further break down into multiple uh, subclasses. So the latest uh, studies using the single cell multi-omics approaches have identified over um, 100 uh, cell types uh, based on their uh, gene expression profile, their morphology, their electrophysiological properties, and also their connectivities. So during the brain development, uh, the cortical inhibited neurons are produced uh, from three transient uh, progenitor domains, including the MG, uh, the CG, and the preoptic areas. They are all outside uh, the cortex. And each of these uh, regions uh, can produce very different types of cortical um, inhibited neurons. And at the meantime, uh, those neurons are produced in a sequential order during the development. So our knowledge about the cortical uh, inhibiting neuron diversity and also their uh, embryonic origins become uh, largely expanded over the past decade. But how uh, exactly uh, different types of cortical inhibiting neurons acquire their fate uh, during the development is still uh, not clear. So I have been studying on uh, uh, these issues over the past few years. So basically uh, the goal uh, of our study is to uh, firstly understand when uh, different types of cortical inhibiting neurons acquire their fate uh, during development. And then we ask uh, what the underlying uh, molecular programs drive their uh, cell diversification. And finally, what are the common and the unique uh, developmental trajectories uh, among those cells. So the major uh, uh, approaches uh, we have taken to uh, solve those questions are the single cell RNA-seq and also the single cell uh, spatial transcriptomics. So I will briefly talk about those studies today and mainly focus on the ongoing work. So firstly, to understand how early uh, the cell fate decisions are made, uh, we dissect uh, 
the tissues from the MGE and the CGE uh, from the mops embryo at early developmental time point, E12 and a half and E14 and a half, when the cortical uh, inhibiting neurons started to be produced uh, from those regions. So we did uh, the single cell RNA seq uh, by using the smart uh, protocol, and we got uh, the gene expression profile uh, of over 2,000 cells at that time. So to determine uh, which types of the cortical inhibiting neurons can be uh, recognized based on their transcriptional profile in our data sets, we integrate uh, our data sets with a uh, published single cell RNA seq data sets of adult mouse cortex, uh, in which uh, 23 uh, cortical inhibiting neurons uh, types are identified. So um, this uh, TSNP plot uh, shows that the cells from two data sites are perfectly merged, and the cells from the adult data sites are labeled by a different color, as you can see here. And then we assign the identity of adult inhibiting neurons to the embryonic neurons and match to them uh, by the KNN method. And accordingly, we managed to define 11 uh, cell types in the embryonic neurons in our data sets. So this result suggests that for some types of the cortical uh, inhibited neurons, their uh, cell identity are specified quite early uh, in development. And among uh, those 11 types we identified, uh, there are so there are three uh, SST expressing clusters. And based on their gene expression profile, we believe that they belong to uh, three subclasses of SST uh, inhibiting neurons. They are the marginality cell, non marginality cell, and the long projecting cell. So, here another uh, study I got involved uh, in recently, uh, we study uh, the developmental trajectories of cortical inhibiting neurons during human brain development. And we found that, sorry, and we found that uh, almost all of the uh, cortical inhibiting neuron subclasses, uh, including those three uh, SST uh, expressing subclasses can be detected at an early developmental stage uh, in the human fetal brain. So this uh, result further reinforce uh, the idea that the cell fate specification of cortical inhibiting neuron occur early in, the, in development in both uh, human and, and rodents. Uh, right. From above studies, we know uh, that uh, the identity of uh, SST inhibiting neuron subclasses, including the multinoti, non multinoti and the lung protection cells can be detected shortly after the neurogenesis, but we still don't know when and how the identity of SST neuron subtypes are specified. So to solve uh, these problems, uh, we carried out another uh, single cell RNA experiment uh, on the SST uh, inhibiting neurons from the mouse cortex at three developmental uh, time points, the E16 and a half, P1 uh, and P5. So we generate uh, three data sets corresponding to the time point we studied. And then we combine uh, those three data sets into a single data set uh, containing the gene expression profile of over uh, 9,000 uh, single cells. And then we classified uh, those cells into 12 uh, cell clusters by the iterative uh, clustering approach. And we annotate uh, them uh, by uh, their marker gene expression. So similar to the previous findings, was we found three uh, SST subclasses, the Martinotti cell, uh, the non martinotti cell, and the long projecting cell. And more importantly, uh, each of them can be further uh, subdivided into multiple uh, clusters, as you can see here. So in a recent uh, published uh, single cell multionics study, uh, 28 uh, cortical inhibiting neuron types 
are detected based on their uh, morphology and their electrophysiological property and also their gene expression profile. So uh, they called those types the MET type. So we asked if those adult uh, MET types can be also detected uh, in our developmental data sets. So we directly compare uh, the gene expression profile of SST neurons clusters in our data sets uh, to uh, that of the uh, adult SST MET types. So hopefully uh, you can see from this uh, heat map that both the developmental and the adult uh, SST neurons correspond very well at the subclass level, uh, the multi-multi, the non-multi-multi, and the long projecting. Uh, but this is not a surprise. And more importantly, if we have a closer look at each of these blocks, uh, you can see uh, that uh, the uh, cell clusters from the developmental data sets have a clear one to one uh, matching to the adult uh, counterpart. I think this result uh, indicates uh, that the identity of SST neuron subtypes are likely to be specified early in development according to the gene expression features. So next, we uh, examined the spatial location of SST uh, inhibiting neurons in the developing mouse cortex at P5 uh, to see if their laminar allocation is completed uh, by uh, this time. So we did uh, a spatial transcriptomics on the mouse uh, brain sections using uh, the multiplex single nuclear a single molecule fish and an image-based approach. And this uh, approach allow uh, us to examine uh, 160 genes at uh, the single cell spatial resolution. So actually we reported uh, over 40,000 cells in this study and identified over, over uh, 3,600 uh, SST inhibiting neurons. Uh, based on the expression of SST, GAT1, GAT2, and the average six expression. So we also classified uh, those uh, neurons and identified eight, uh, we call them uh, spatial types, as you can see from this uh, unit plot. Um, we also found uh, that all of the SST uh, spatial cluster with spatial type correlate very well uh, with the SST inhibiting neural subtypes identified in our uh, single cell heart study, as you can see from this two uh, UMAP plot. And this allow us to use this uh, spatial types to check out the spatial location of the corresponding uh, SST neural subtypes in our uh, single cell heart seek data cells. And firstly, uh, we found uh, that uh, the lamina allocation or lamina distribution of those uh, spatial types are quite different. For example, uh, for some uh, spatial type, they only placed in the deep layers, layer five, six, and for the others, they placed in both the deeper and upper layers. And we also compare uh, the lamina allocation of uh, the somatostatin spatial types to their corresponding adult MET types, as we can see here. And interesting, our uh, quantification result uh, shows that the lamina distribution of deeper layer, uh, deep layer uh, SST spatial type match quite well with the corresponding adult MET type, as you can see here. But this is not, for, not the case for the uh, spatial types occupied in both upper and deeper layers. So this uh, result, I think, indicates that the laminar allocation of deep layer SST neurons is completed first uh, in development. And more importantly, it doesn't depend on their cell type identity. And finally, we are uh, asked uh, if uh, different types of SST inhibiting neurons follow a similar or a distinct uh, developmental trajectory during their maturation. And to address uh, this, uh, we firstly picked up 
a set of genes uh, whose functions are associated with the neural maturation and development. And we use those uh, genes to generate eight gene modules. We call them the developmental gene modules. And then we use those modules to perform uh, the diffusion map analysis and to build up the uh, developmental trajectories of the SSP inhibiting neurons. So the result uh, shows that the SSP neurons diverge into two separate branches along uh, the pseudo time trajectories, as we can see. And interestingly, uh, we found that, that the branch one cells uh, contains only the SST long projection cells, while uh, the branch two uh, contains both the Martin OT and non Martin OT cells. And this, uh, I think, this data indicates uh, that uh, different SST inhibiting neuron subclasses uh, follow a very uh, distinct uh, developmental trajectory from the very beginning of their development. Uh, next, we uh, sought to investigate uh, the transcript transcriptional programs driving the divergent developmental trajectories of those cells. So we identified different sets of genes uh, whose expression are enriched in uh, each branches as shown in this uh, heat map. So this analysis uh, highlights the key uh, molecular differences that are required for the different types of SST neurons to, to mature. And interestingly, uh, we uh, performed the geo enrichment analysis on those genes, and we found uh, that genes highly expressed in uh, the branch one cells are usually related to, uh, for example, synapt synaptogenesis, synaptic signaling, and synaptic transmission. Well, uh, the genes uh, highly expressed in the branch two uh, cells are uh, related to early uh, neurodevelopmental events such as neurogenesis, uh, neural projections, and many others. So I think this analysis suggests that the long projection cell uh, seems to, to be more matured uh, at the developmental stage we study on them according to the gene expression profile. And indeed, uh, our pseudo time uh, analysis further confirmed uh, that the lung projecting cells are more matured uh, compared to uh, the Martin OT and non Martin OT cells according to their relative position along the pseudo time trajectories, as you can see uh, from this uh, plot. So uh, I, I think I have to stop here uh, due to the time constraint. Uh, a, a quick uh, summary of what I have talked about today. I think our data uh, suggests that the cortical inhibiting neuron diversity generated very early in the embryonic development. And the timing of the lamina allocation of different inhibiting neurons differ very uh, differ greatly during development. And finally, uh, different types of inhibiting neuron uh, exhibit very unique uh, developmental trajectories. And finally, I would like to thank my collaborator, Oscar Marin, at the King's College London uh, in the UK, and Lina Lee uh, at the VIB Centre for the Brain and Disease Research in the Belgium. And also, I would like to thank my lab members for their hard work. And I thank you very much for your lesson, and I'm, I'm ha very happy to take the questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Al. Uh, I have a quick question for the for the SST and PV. Uh, so you you mentioned that you do believe there is a special uh, different program governing the SST and PV development, early in development, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, 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 I, I, I was, so so I will talk to you later about it because we are pretty interested by the PV development. Okay, now the question for from Kang. Right, no problem. Hi. So actually, yeah, yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, great talk. I, I was just wondering whether the sequencing is deep enough to probe into some of the um, developmental biology questions, like the molecular mechanisms of forming a long projection, for example. Like if you were to compare the 
marginati and non marginati cells with the with the long projection cells are are there are there reasonable candidate that you can you know postulate that might have you know be required forming like a long projection yeah i think that's a great question uh, i i didn't have time actually today to show some data Actually, we identify some key regulators by this sequencing study. And some of them actually are very important for um, regulating the axonal projection patterns. And we also did some uh, experiment to prove this, uh, but I, I didn't show those data today. And also uh, from uh, the, the single cell RNA-seq uh, work I did before, we also identified a couple of key regulators for uh, the cell fate specification uh, for different types of uh, inhibiting neuron like PV and the cement stating uh, we also prove their functions by doing some functional uh, validation work. So basically, we, we do find some inf uh, uh, important information. On the other hand, I, I do agree with that. So the uh, platform we used, uh, the 10x single cell or music platform we used, uh, have some uh, limitations, to be honest, uh, in terms of the number of genes detected per cell and also the number of cells can be detected. So uh, yeah. it's highly likely that we are missing some quite important information, uh, which are, I mean, uh, some genes, for example, or uh, level of gene expression, which are quite important for some uh, developmental event. So uh, that's why other people tend to choose, uh, for example, SmartSet or other platform to dig into uh, uh, those things. Those platforms have definitely more information. Yes. A question from Shitai, please. Uh, yes, uh, very nice talk. Um, uh, just a quick question. At the very beginning, you separate uh, cells from uh, uh, LGE and CGE, right? Did yeah. you separately analyze the two sections and see whether different neurons are um, differentially generated from these two regions? Yes, we, we did this, we did this. Uh, actually, we found a couple of things quite interesting. Firstly, we uh, identified uh, progenitor cells uh, specific to MG or CGE in terms of the gene expression profile, uh, we identify some novel marker genes for the MG presenter and for the CG presenter. And secondly, we do find uh, very distinct uh, genetic programs driving uh, the cell fate diversification uh, among MG and CG. And we, as I mentioned before, so we validate some key, uh, the function of some key regulators in regulating uh, the cell phase specification for somatostatin and also for uh, the serotonin receptor 3A uh, populations. Yes. Thank you. Hey, uh, there are two questions from Chad Bard. Emmy, do you want to ask a question yourself? Or uh, Doc and uh, from Chad Bard? Hi. Is that, is that Emmy? Yeah. I guess the question for Emmy is whether the uh, gene expression has a correlate with the traditional uh, morphology uh, features people identify SSD. Is there any correlation uh, so from the, the, the different targeting uh, subgroups to talk about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a perfect question. Uh, I think I showed this uh, during my talk. Um, there are published data sets. Uh, recording, uh, I think over, uh, yes, 4,000 uh, single cells in the adult mouse cortex by using the single cell multi-omics. So the, the reason they choose this uh, method is to uh, correlate, uh, as you say, the morphology, uh, the gene expression features and uh, the electrophysiological properties uh, to combine those factors and by using this information to, to properly define a cell type. So uh, I think this is the trend in, in, the, in the field, try to define a cell type, not only based on one aspect, for example, gene expression, but uh, using for a, a combinatory uh, approach uh, to properly define. Yes, we, we uh, for our study, we did a comparison of our uh, 
uh, of the cell cluster be identified in, in our study. And uh, I think this heat map shows uh, the good correspondence between uh, the cell types in our data size with the uh, cell types identified in this uh, multi omics uh, study. So uh, one more question from some students, I guess. Do you want to ask a question yourself? Was the positional uh, information determining uh, the uh, beta of interneurons? I'm not sure. No, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether I get your point. So. Uh, it's okay. Uh, so the positioning. Yeah. Uh, positional uh, information for for which part of AMG and MGE to differentiate oh, uh, to the, is that? Yeah, it's actually, uh, our uh, spatial transcriptomics actually are carried out mm -hmm. in the portals. Uh, here mm -hmm. is the uh, illustration. So yeah, yeah, at P5. So we only study the uh, location of the, the cells in the cortex, not in the MGE or, or CD region. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, all right, I have one, one last question for the uh, subtype of PV neurons again. So there are four subtypes you're suggesting. Oh, right. So is that uh, possible to use this spacing marker to, uh, to, work, to work out this uh, uh, distribution of the subtype of the probably mean positive neuron in the, say, adult mouse cortex? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, there are, yeah. Uh, basically, there are three or four, depending on uh, how you yeah. think about this, uh, subclasses. Okay. Uh, okay. of PB neurons. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. we uh, have some marker genes for those subclasses. Uh, but the problem is um, that um, those marker genes are not that specific, to be honest, right. to, to those types. So usually people have to, to use a intersection way, to combinatory way, uh, way to okay. label those uh, types uh, to follow right. up their development. So mm -hmm. yeah. That's, that's why what I'm, I'm asking. Okay, great. Is there any more questions? All right. I've uh, been talking more in, in afterwards. It has a lot whole new sources to come up with. All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much, for everybody. Thank you, all the speakers, and Shao and Da, and the other uh, audience. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Right. Everyone. Thank you. So, See everyone next week. Next, next week. Thank you.